Welcome to Season 3 of Students of Mind, the podcast that's all about opening up and normalizing discussions about mental health in ways that anyone can comprehend. In the first two seasons, we sat down with mental health experts and survivors to give you a full circle picture of each topic. In this new season, we will continue to explore the world of mental health through the insights of experts, healers, and individuals with lived experience. From alternative healing modalities to living with multiple illnesses, this season we will cover a wide range of topics with the help of a diverse selection of guests. My name is Jade, and today we have a bonus episode as part of the Let's Talk Psychedelic Assisted Therapy series, where I'll be sitting down with Julia Blum once again to talk about her most recent psychedelic journey with the medicine Ibogaine. I hope by listening to the show, you're able to learn something new and gain some encouragement through hearing our experts and listening to the journeys of our guests. However, this show is not a substitute for professional advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your mental health professional or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have about your condition. Never disregard professional advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on the Students of Mind podcast. Today's guest is Julia Blum. Julia, who was on the last episode, is a psychedelic educator and advocate who has dedicated her work to destigmatizing psychedelic healing and making information about plant medicines more accessible. Recently, Julia traveled to Mexico to experience the African psychedelic Iboga, And in today's episode, we talk all about her experience. So welcome back, Julia. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you about Iboga today. Um, But before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Yeah, sure. Um, I have dedicated my life to making psychedelic healing accessible for people and educating people about it. So in my in my day uh, job, I work a lot on, you know, psychedelic research and policy and trying to really get this country politically and, and socially into a place where we can integrate those therapies into mental health treatments across the country. And then on um, on the side to that, I started writing and making TikToks about psychedelic education, which really just came from this longing that I had for other people to, you know, learn more about it after they've changed my life so substantially. And I wanted to get the word out there. And I also just wanted to break some of the stereotypes around these substances that I know are still super prevalent. So that's that's my my passion project is has always been, you know, educating people about plant medicines and other psychedelics and the healing potential they have. Great. Yeah, I am a huge fan of you and your work and have just really loved how you present information and all the work you're doing to destigmatize it is so great. So thank you. Um Today, so you recently uh, worked with Iboga, and I wanted to just sit down and talk to you about your experience. I think first, um, I was just watching some of your TikToks, and you talk a little bit about uh, the history behind this medicine. So 
before we talk about your personal experience, can we talk about kind of like the traditions that originated with this medicine? Yeah, I love that you're starting with this because I feel like this sometimes, you know, gets squeezed in somewhere towards the end when we talk about all these novel psychedelic therapies that are really not novel at all. <laughs> so I'm glad we're starting there. Um, yeah, so for traditional use for this specific plant, iboga comes from a West African country called Gabon. And there is a specific tradition in Gabon, and iboga is actually a national treasure in Gabon, the plant itself. And um, the the Bwiti tradition, um, they are really the, the wisdom holders for this plant. And it's a really fascinating tradition um, that has been around for millennia, and they've used these these plants, Iboga specifically, for thousands of years um, as a core pillar of their their tribes and their communities. And if, there's a few different things, a, a few different interesting things about the Buiti. And, and number one is that they they sometimes call the Buiti tradition a school of life. And the, the Buiti, they don't have beliefs. They believe there is one single truth that is universal and that is there whether you believe in it or not but they also believe that in order to get to that truth you have to experience it it cannot be communicated through words so all of the wisdom in this tradition it's not captured anywhere you can't really read about it in books because the Buiti say if you want to find the truth you have to find it for yourself and one way to do that is by experiencing iboga which sometimes is also called the truth serum and after my experience I, I certainly understand why so there's this really rich indigenous use and there are other you know not as ancient but more traditional uses too where the the colonizers brought ibogaine which is the psychoactive component and in, in the iboga plant and at least two other plants that we know of brought it to France and they started selling it in French pharmacies as a stimulant to help people who are struggling with fatigue and brain fog. So that was, you know, that happened in like the 1920s. Um, so Ibogaine has been around for, for quite some time and more recently, and it's only now, you know, really been popularized primarily because of its effect for addiction recovery, specifically with opioids. But there's a lot of history there, and and the Buiti they have these really elaborate initiation rites where members of the community will eat large amounts of iboga, and the psychoactive is in the root of the plant, so you really eat these like huge root bark, you know, pieces, and the journey lasts two to five days if you eat iboga. So it truly is, you know, a rite of passage that a lot of people in the community undergo, and. There are quite a few, I think, Westerners who've undergone the Buiti initiations because it's not technically if you can go there and, you know, participate. Um, I'm not saying that's recommended, but I certainly know of a lot of people that have done that. And I just want to caveat by saying that I have not done that. <laughs> so everything that I, you know, know about the Buiti, I've I've learned through other people and not directly, right? But yeah, that's that's pretty much the the history behind the specific plant. Very interesting. And yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we covered that because I know how important it is when working and talking about these medicines to acknowledge the traditions that they came from. So thank you for that. Um, and now I'm just wondering, like, what what had you heard about this specific medicine that drew you to it and, and made you want to work with it? I was quite intimidated by iboga for many years, and I did not feel a calling to sit with it for a very long time, precisely for those two reasons that I'd only heard about it in the context of these excessive initiations, which were off the table for me, and for as a treatment for severe opioid addiction, which I didn't struggle with, right? So it just never seemed, you know, really necessary. And I, I started getting more curious about ibogaine over the last year or so, um, as I learned a little bit more about the psychedelic itself, because it has a few unique properties that makes it really stand out from other psychedelic medicines. And that's when I really, you know, began to develop this curiosity. And then I, I found this clinic in Mexico 
that had an approach where they they do treat addicts and they have a very established, you know, um, infrastructure to help people um, transition them to other medicines off opioids and then to help them, you know, completely recover with the help of Ibogaine, Ibogaine treatment. But they don't only work with addicts. They also work with people who just want to use it as a tool for self-development, spiritual exploration and, and growth, which is more of what I was interested in. And in addition to that, they also use it increasingly to work with eating disorders. And in my history, you know, I use other psychedelic medicines to to heal my eating disorder. And I was intrigued by Albigain because it's one of the few medicines that I think people really only do once. And I saw that I could see that if it really did, you know, what everyone says it does, that it would be a huge opportunity for the treatment of eating disorders. So that's what I was, I guess, most curious about to witness um, how it would wor work on that. And, and someone, I mean, I've overcome my eating disorder, but I, I still think that it's it's helpful to to explore. And I really saw myself as like, if this is something, you know, that can help a lot of people. And it's really, I think Ibogaine is the most misunderstood psychedelic substances out of all of them um, because of, you know, its history and this like very specific use case around um, drug addiction. Um, but I was really hopeful that it could be more than that. And that's why I saw myself a little bit as a guinea pig <laughs> to experience it firsthand and see what it's all about. That's really interesting. That's honestly one of the, this is just a side note, one of the reasons I'm really interested in psychedelics because of my eating disorder and what I've heard they can do for people with eating disorders so i mm -hmm. i think that's really cool that you went in with that in your mind and oh so you mentioned that there are like specific things about iboga that kind of makes it different from other psychedelics can you talk about what some of those things are yeah definitely so maybe to to caveat that there's a difference between iboga and ibogaine, and I always use the two names interchangeably, but it's not technically the same thing. So iboga is the iboga plant that grows in Africa, right? And ibogaine is in the root of the iboga plant. But there are other plants that also have ibogaine in them, right, that are not the iboga plant. And the iboga journey is a lot longer and allegedly a lot more violent, lasts two to five days, whereas ibogaine synthesized or like extracted so to say from the plant because you can't really synthesize it the mo molecular structure is too complex which i find fascinating like all other psychedelics we can create in a lab not ibogaine we have to take it from the plants right um and it's shorter so it's 12 to 24 hours and it's a lot more easy to dose so all the clinics use ibogaine so i always use the word ibogaine but it comes from iboga and i think that's just important for people to note um so there's a few things that make ibogaine unique. The first one is that it's one of the few psychedelics that really have health risks, right? Like you can eat mushrooms and you can drink ayahuasca and the risks are virtually non-existent, right? They're not, not lethal, these drugs. It's different with ibogaine because ibogaine works on your heart and it elevates your heart rate. And that's why it's so, so critical to do it in a setting where you're safe and where you have clinical supervision and you're attached to a heart rate monitor. So now that's the physical way that iboga works on the heart, right? It also works on the heart in a spiritual way, which I think for me is so fascinating because a lot of the other psychedelics, they what they do is they connect you outwardly with the universe and with other plants and animals and other sometimes even other realms and and other galaxies, right? The iboga journey is the opposite. It, the iboga just takes you deeper into your own soul. And it really is much more about your life on planet Earth and your role here and your purpose here. So it's almost like a direct conversation with your heart, your soul, whatever you want to call it, right? So that's one thing that really makes it a very fascinating plant. The other thing that's unique about ibogaine is that it stays in your system for up to three months after you have your journey in the form of a metabolite called noribogaine. And noribogaine binds to your neurotransmitters. So it's like a chemical support structure. And this noribogaine is the, the chemical that interrupts the withdrawal symptoms from opioids, for example. 
and there's no ibogaine is exactly the reason why habit change after ibogaine is so much easier than normally right so it's it's very unique that you have this like almost you know integration support through the plant coming out of the journey um so the ibogaine glow from what i hear and i'm obviously still very early in it it lasts for like up to three months and i've even heard people say they would do ibogaine just for the way that they can rewire and repattern in the three to four months after the journey, even if there was no psychedelic journey at all. Um, so those are, I think, two of, of the more fascinating qualities of, of ibogaine. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I feel like that's like, I mean, integration we know is so important and the fact that you have that chemical support is is so unique. Like I've I haven't heard that with any other psychedelic. That's so cool. Yeah, it is. And the and the government is actually invested in a startup that's investigating a version of Ibogaine that is non hallucinatory, where you only have the, the effects of like the after, right? Without the tripping, essentially um in in the battle to to combat the opioid crisis so that's an it's it will be interesting to see where where that lands and how helpful that will be for people but it's great to see at least that there's some you know movement um from our government to research the possibilities yeah for sure great so Wow, I'm already learning so much. I, I'm loving this conversation. Um, <laughs> I want to talk more about your experience. So can we talk about what the um, preparation process was like as you were preparing to work with this medicine? Yeah, it was actually a lot more. I mean, I've always been intentional with, with psychedelic journeys, but I've never, I think, put so much preparation into a journey as with this one. For good reason, because I was really, you know, I had a lot of respect for this plan and I did not want to show up unprepared. In the clinic that I went to, they match you with an integration coach ahead of your stay. So you have at least two sessions with that person, right? And so the way that we prepared was that we started talking broadly about like what are the intentions, right? And like really honing in on like what the things are that you want to get out of the journey. And then we did a super interesting exercise, which was so illuminating for me, which a lot of times people are asked to develop questions for the medicine because with Ibogaine, you really have the opportunity to ask, or a lot of people have the opportunity to ask the, the medicine questions. And then I remember my coach did this exercise with me where she said, okay, so imagine you have the the ultimate you know, source of truth that has all the answers that you could possibly want sitting in front of you. What would you ask it, Right. And I started, you know, asking the questions and kept going, kept going, kept going, everything from like my health to career purpose, whatever. And we came up with like 30 questions that I really wanted answers to. And then she did a little exercise with me where she, we we switched um, spots and she said, okay, I'm going to, we're going to put you into your heart space. And she did that by just guiding a short meditation and like guiding my hands to be on my body and then she asked me back the questions that I had told her for the medicine, right? And as it turns out, for a lot of these questions, intuitively, I could find answers already within myself. So then it was only the questions where I couldn't do that that I brought to the medicine. So they were very specific. And one of the main ones was around my childhood because I don't have memories before the age of 12 except for the trauma memories that have come up through healing work. But I know my childhood wasn't just trauma. I know it was beautiful for most most of the part, right? And so my only question for the medicine was really to, to show me my childhood, which it did, which was beautiful. Um, but yeah, that was a big part. And then I arrived on site at the clinic. And I think what I was really happy about is that I had a few days before to really get into the right head and heart space for this journey rather than like jumping into it like the day after you get there. And I had like a daily session with a therapist and it's just everything. The whole experience was super well-rounded because I could also tell with the therapist that she's just been working with, you know, people who use plant medicines to heal for years and years and years. And so the way that she guided me through like what I really needed out of this journey was super, super helpful. So I feel like I had a lot of outside support. 
and then just getting in the right, you know, headspace, starting to meditate more and slow things down and also, you know, trying to keep the external stimulation to a minimum, the closer the day of the actual journey comes and turning off the phone the day before, things like that. That That's, I, I think, pretty much all that, that went into the preparation for this one. And I didn't intentionally didn't read too much about other people's journey because I didn't want to be too scared about it. I knew I have heard there are some crazy stories with Ibogaine, so I decided to not expose myself to any of them because that's always the thing with psychedelic journeys. Whatever you hear about it, you're not going to experience what you hear because it's always going to be a very individual experience. So I had a feeling it might not help too much. So I didn't really do that much preparation in terms of like education about the experience itself per se, but that was intentional. Interesting. Yeah. It's it's really nice that you had so much support going into it with the integration coach and a few days of like getting centered before you actually worked with the medicine. Um, so let's talk about like the day that you ingested the medicine. What kind of did you do in, in the beginning of the day to prepare? Mm -hmm. What was the setup like to ingesting it? And then I guess some of your the the biggest takeaways from the actual journey. Yeah, let's get into it. So the day before my journey, I they have a little candle ritual where you think about your intentions and then you paint a candle based on that. And then the candle is going to burn throughout your journey, which I thought was such a beautiful little ritual. So I had painted this candle and I brought it to the treatment room and we started early in the morning around 1030. So you arrive fasted and the clinical director was there and he talked me through some final, you know, tips and tricks on how to navigate this specific medicine. And then they do a lot of prep in terms of like screenings and EKGs and all of the medical stuff. And then when you're ready to go, you get the medicine in the form of capsules and you take it. And then within 50 minutes to an hour, the journey starts. And for me, it really started within 20 minutes very quickly. The moment I started feeling something, which there's with Ibogaine, it's a very physical experience. So you'll feel either tingling or like numbing or like pulsing in different parts of your body. Some people hear a clicking sound or like a knocking sound. Um, and, and for me, like, I just felt this tingle and I told the, there's a 24 seven nurse who's with you throughout the entire journey. Um, I told him like, I'm starting to feel the medicine and he rushed over to give me the headphones and the eye mask because they have a beautiful playlist that they share with you during the journey. And I was in a rush. I'm telling you, like he was connecting the Spotify to the thing. And I was like, Oh no, the medicine is here. I need the music now. I was getting like antsy, but once I had it, it was so immediate. Like I've never had it come up like that. Like everything else is a lot more gradual. I began like when it's here, it's here. And then like, it just starts like straight away. And I'm not going to lie. The first hour was the most challenging psychedelic experience that I've ever had. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way. For me, there's always somewhat of a correlation between the amount of challenge and the amount of long lasting benefit that I get out of these journeys. But what happened essentially in the first hour was that, so you have all these physical effects of the medicine and I think are common, like everyone kind of experiences the same physical aspects. And then the mental is very individual, right? So for the physical, you don't really, you can't move your body. Like you lose 80% of your coordination. So you're just like glued to the bed and it's, you, you can feel the medicine rushing through your body. I could really just feel it scan my body. And I could at some point hear this like, dit, 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 and like, as it like traveled up and scanned like every cell of my body up and down, up and down. And then my heart was beating like crazy. And that's where I was so happy to be in that clinical setting because if I hadn't been, I would have been like, oh, I'm getting a heart attack. I don't know what's going on. But I, they tell you like, unless we like intervene, you're safe and you're fine. We're monitoring everything all the time. Right. So you, I'm lying there, all of this stuff is going on in my body and it feels like my heart is jumping outside of my chest. And then for me, the mental thing, which was like a core component of my journey was that the medicine, the first hour really just exposed um, the extent of my mental chatter to me. And it did that by bombarding me with intrusive thoughts for at least an hour. I don't know how much time it was, but imagine like 
the most intrusive thoughts you've ever had coming at you all at once and like thousands of them like it's so hard to talk about it because you cannot have more than like a certain number of thoughts in like regular consciousness but in ibogaine consciousness it was just like every intrusive and self-criticizing thought that i ever had just came at me and it, it was almost felt like it was trying to pull me apart and i was really just trying to stay present with the music and not let these like thoughts completely take me and rip me apart and that was like that was a struggle I'm not gonna lie and then at, at one point I remember the medicine just like had elevated my heart so much and at one point it erupted almost like a volcano and the contents of my heart spilled into the rest of my body and filled like my entire body and that's when the journey really shifted and that's when the vision began and the visions began so I began in general the journey is in two phases the first phase which lasts anywhere from like four to eight hours is the visionary phase. And the second phase is the introspective phase. And both are equally important, right? But in the visionary phase, it's very, very common to have what you could call the life review. And that's another thing that's unique about Ibogaine, where people go through not one or two specific trauma memories, but like all your childhood like all of your significant moments in your life that have made you and impacted your soul both positive and traumatic um up until this day now right and you really watch it like on a tv screen almost and because i'd done a lot of work with my subconscious and with other plants i didn't expect to find anything that i wasn't aware of there were a few things you know that i saw that have just left like gave me more insight into why things were the way they were but I think there's nothing new um, for me, at least. I think if I think about someone who comes to this medicine who's never done any other psychedelic work or subconscious work, and then you are suddenly faced with all of this, which you know, might not remember, you might have repressed half of it. I think that's why Ibogaine is so hard for some people because it's truly like it doesn't leave anything out. So I had all of these visions and then at a certain point, I the vision stopped and that was only three hours in. So it was a bit like, huh, that was it. I thought it's like four to eight hours. Like it felt so fast. And I felt like I wasn't feeling the medicine anymore. So they, they monitored my heart rate. They said, oh, the heart rate's normal again. But then they had to keep me just to be extra safe for another few hours. So I was just lying there a little bit bored and thinking, hmm, am I doing Ibogaine wrong? Should I now start thinking about my intentions? Like what's going on? Like all the mental chatter, like back and forth, back and forth. And I left the treatment room eventually, and that was like 10 hours in. And then I went outside, and outside I had this moment that really completely pivoted the trajectory of my journey, which is I was so caught up in this like mental back and forth about like a very specific thing, which in my case was like, should I eat dinner or not? Because I was offered dinner and I couldn't decide. I'm like, mm, I'm not really hungry, but I don't want to restrict. It was this back and forth and it was tedious. And then my therapist saw me outside and she came and sat down next to me. And I mentioned a little bit about my journey. And then I said, oh, and I don't know if I should eat. And she's like, wait, okay, let's see. She did the same exercise that this integration coach did with me, which is like, put your hands on your body, take a deep breath and ask your gut if it's hungry. And immediately the answer came, no. And then it was done, right? And that really shifted everything for me because after that, I have felt like I had this extreme clarity that I've never experienced before where with every single thought, I could identify the chatter for what it was and I could identify whether thoughts were coming from the ego or from the heart. And that's really, really when I began having the downloads and insights that Ibogaine is also so known for because this medicine keeps you up. I was awake all night. I was writing down download after download and it was all messages that deeply deeply resonated and built on like all the years of spiritual work that I'd done before but a lot of it you know I intellectually understood but I hadn't felt it in my heart and now it all made sense and it all came together and the medicine really showed me like rather than like giving me answers to my specific questions that I came with it showed me where to find them within myself by teaching me the language of my heart and by teaching me how to differentiate the language of the heart from the voice of the ego and teaching me that the heart doesn't discriminate among emotions. One emotion is not better than the other because the heart simply wants to feel because feelings are the way that the heart communicates its needs. 
and that's a guiding force for you to give your heart what it needs, right? And I use the heart word here because that's just what I resonated with in my journey. You could use any other word, like in IFS therapy, it might be called the the self with a capital S, right? You could call it your soul, whatever it is, like the part of you that is wise and compassionate and loving. Um, and so my my the whole rest of my journey was just about those topics, like heart heart space versus ego space and how to live between the two. And so I really felt like it gave me tools that I can use for the rest of my life. Wow. That <laughs> is so beautiful and sounds incredibly intense. Um, but yeah, like seems like it, it resulted in something so beautiful. And uh, so you said the, the duration of the experience was 10 hours? Yeah, so it's it's tricky because I think when people say like Ibogaine lasts 12 to 24 hours, they talk about both phases. So the visionary phase is usually up to eight hours. For me, it was only three. But for me, the second phase, the introspective phase was probably even longer than 24 hours because I was still the next night, I was still writing down things. Wow, oh, that's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, how... After, did you um, stay at the retreat center for a few days after the experience as well? Yeah, I did. I did. And I'm so glad about that. And I wish I had even more time because I felt like in a very delicate state, I felt very emotionally open. And just this whole topic of emotions, you know, it was very, very important for me. One of my intentions was going in to learn how to be with my inner ocean because I feel so overwhelmed. I'm a very sensitive person and I sometimes feel so overwhelmed with my emotions and I still do sometimes things to not feel, um, right? And that's like what I wanted to get out of it, like the the trust and the capacity and the resilience to feel everything at the depth that it's emerging in, which I think, you know, that's essentially what addiction is too. It's deeply sensitive people that need to numb because what they're feeling and thinking has become too much, right? And the medicine, like a whole section about like the teachings were that the medicine explained to me in detail how addiction works and why, um, why this medicine is so effective to beat addiction. And it all comes down to emotions. It truly all comes down to emotions. So I was in a very emotionally open and fragile state afterwards. And I'm kind of still in it, to be honest, two weeks later, like my heart feels very open and nothing's really gotten in the way yet of, uh, that experience. I, I know it won't last forever, but I feel very clear on the medicine also gave me like very specific tasks for integration um, on how to like maintain this as the medicine and the physical, you know, part of it wears off. How can I build practices that strengthen that capacity organically while the medicine is wearing off? So I feel just super, super clear coming out of this journey on what to do and where to go. Yeah, I was, that was literally my next question. Like, I know it's only been two weeks, but what are some of the things that you've been doing to integrate your experience? So I'm not doing anything necessarily new that I haven't done before. It's always pretty much the same practices, but I just, right now, I feel so motivated to pursue them with a lot more rigor than I normally would, I think because it's so clear to me now how it works. And there's really two components to it. There's meditation and mindfulness and there's embodiment. And meditation and mindfulness is the practice of quieting down the chatter, or if you can't quiet it down, at least creating that distance between you and the contents of your mind, right? That's step number one. And I think the more you do that, the more you quiet your mind. But if you quiet the voice of your ego, what are you going to listen to, right? You need something else to listen to. So that's the second step, which is embodiment, which is making space for the voice of intuition and the voice of your heart to come through so that you have another guiding force beyond the very loud ego voice, right? And so all of the practices I do fall into the category of the first one or the second one, right? And so it's not new things. A lot of, like, I think the biggest thing for, for mindfulness is definitely meditation, but I'm also a lot more conscious about what I put in my mind to begin with. And that was something that the medicine showed me too, because I was on TikTok two days before watching like a random TikTok video and it showed up in my journey. And I was like, 
what is this random TikTok video doing in my sacred plant medicine journey is not supposed to be here. And the medicine just answered, well, everything that you put in your mind, it stays there. And that was such a good lesson for me because I've, I can tell you, I've barely had any, you know, interest in consuming any social media since just because I'm so hyper aware right now of like, what are the things that amplify the chatter and the voice of your ego and social media is a huge one, right? So cutting down on those things, even cutting down on like I was reading so much and always just, you know, filling my head with information, which is great. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but if you do that and if you don't really leave space for stillness, it's going to be hard to hear the voice of intuition because you're going to be very externally guided, right? And and so all of the other practices are around like, quieting down and finding more silence and letting my mind also wander more and doing a lot of body-based practices that connect me with physical sensations because that's another thing that the medicine taught me. If you want to learn the language of your heart, you have to stay as close as possible to the level of physical sensation because the heart communicates in feelings, right? And even taking it from sensation to feeling the ego interprets the sensations and then labels it as a feeling. So the ego is already tainting that experience. So the closer you can stay just with the sensations that you're feeling when things come up and just stay with that, the more connected you will feel. So a lot of it has truly been about like finding peace in my body and feeling at home in my body and really, really, really learning to listen to it because it has this wisdom that my mind could never get, right? Yeah, that is so beautiful. And yeah, thank just thank you for, for being open to coming on here and sharing about this experience that is so fresh. Um, I'm so excited to like read more about this medicine and um, you know, see more about your experience as you post on TikTok and stuff. But um, yeah. yeah, this was a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming and, and sharing your experience. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. I think it's so great that you're having all of these diverse conversations and that you're also doing the work of educating people about tools to help them explore their minds and with Iboga specifically also explore their hearts, right? Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Students of Mind. I want to give a huge, huge thank you to Julia for coming on the show again. I love talking to her and I am especially so happy that she was able to come on so shortly after this profound experience that she had. So if you'd like to follow her, all of her social links will be in the description of this episode, including her publication where she writes about psychedelic healing. As always, the social links of the Students of Mind team will be in the description as well. If you have a moment, please leave a rating and review for this episode. You can do so by scrolling to the bottom of the podcast to show page on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or by using an app like Podchaser. Thank you so much again for listening. I hope you learned something new or resonated with something you heard today, and I will see you next episode.